This is a Thor News presentation. Thor News presents... I'm cooler than a superconductor. Man, they found a brown dwarf. It's really cold. Yes, the neo -wise found another brown dwarf. And you're saying to yourself right now, this thing is freaking seven light years away. What does it matter? And I guess, yeah, I'm saying that too. I mean, seven light years away. What does it matter? Oh, it's really cold. It's like the Canada of brown dwarfs. Okay, so we'll, we'll name it Canadian Amy Manger. I'm just kidding. She must have been busy. Okay, we'll kick this thing off by uh, reading from our great friend, the bad astronomer, Phil Plate, over at Slate's Bad Astronomy. Now, he starts out by saying, Astronomer finds a brown dwarf, literally, as cold as ice. Dot, dot, dot. And it's right next door. Being the world-renowned, beloved Phil Plate. He can get away with that type of shit, right? I post that on, like, GLP, which is Godlike Productions. I will have Team Hydra on my ass, saying I'm a sensationalist, a fearmonger, a liar, a kook, because it's not next door. Man, you know what? I think I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that experiment. I'm going to say Brown Dwarf right next door. And then see which yahoos come out of the woodwork. I bet one will be named Hydra. One will probably be named Green Girl. Um, okay. I like to read. So now we're going to read. Sweet. Stars are hot, right? You might think that's one of their defining characteristics. But that is not entirely true. Brown dwarfs are star-like objects that are more massive than planets. And remember what angry Neil deGrasse Tyson says, Mass is not weight, dumbass! But not quite massive enough to ignite sustained fusion in their cores. And remember, fusion is when the sun takes Atoms squishes them together to make a big atom. One big atom? Hydrogen fusion is what powers the sun. And science likes to believe it powers every single sun everywhere in the universe. And they got telescopes, man, so don't doubt them. Hydrogen fusion is what powers the sun. And it makes it hot. Some like it hot. At the moment, I'm overweight, so I like it air-conditioned. Nobody likes it when you get too sweaty. TMI. Brown dwarf. Edition. It's the mighty, mighty, mighty pressure of the sun's core that makes that happen. Brown dwarfs don't have the oomph zero zero miles per hour needed to keep that going. Asterisk. Sweet. Love asterisks, man. Brown dwarfs are born hot and then they get cool over time. And now one has been found that is literally as cold as ice. And not only that, but it is very close to our solar system. Notice he italicized very. That is very important. It is just 7.2 light years away. That means if you were being a light, it would only take you 7.2 years to get there. Unless it was traveling right at you, then it would take it 3.6. Unless you fall in space, then it could be here tomorrow and destroy our whole planet. Hey, guess what? Why is this special? This makes it the seventh closest known star to the sun. And Dabu was talking about everybody's got the seventh sigil in their sign. And now we have the seventh brown dwarf. Is that crazy? And now we have the seventh known closest star to the sun, which has officially been named the Canadian Amy Mainzer. And I say that as lovingly as possible. Not only that, but it's very close to our solar system. I already read that again. That's Phil Plate. That's what he looks like. He smiles a lot. Are science and faith compatible? Spitzer says yes. Phil Plate says no. But you and I, we've been through that. Just remind you guys, Phil Plate writes Slate's Bad Astronomy blog. He's an astronomer, a public speaker, a science evangelizer. Evangelizing the fact that um, science and God cannot coexist. We disagree, man. And he is the author of Death from the Skies. A wonderfully witty book on a take where friendly robots and drones kill everybody in the name of science to protect Mother Earth. It's a great read for kids. It's a great bedtime story. Mm, whatever. The object is called Wise Job 5510.83-07-1442.5 period. I know, I know. But it's given that designation based on the fact that it was discovered in data taken by the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer with the rest of the number salad based on its coordinates in the sky. So let's call it, so let's call it Canadian Amy Mainzer for now. And Amy, if you don't think that's a funny joke, and somehow like Russians have strapped you down or forcing you to watch 
this video. Because I, I know you got better things to do than like laugh and smile and have fun. So, and you're watching this and you were offended. I will apologize to you, baby. I mean, scientist, professor. I mean, ma'am, uh, doctor. Mm, oh, captain, my captain. You see, Wise observed the entire sky several times over in its short 13-month lifetime. It was looking at cooler and downright cold objects in the universe. It saw stars, dust clouds, superconductors, galaxies, mediocre conductors, and brown dwarfs. Hundreds of brown dwarfs, in fact. One of them caught the eye of Kevin Laman, an astronomer who specializes in them. What? Isn't them a horror film? He specializes in horror people? Okay. He's a scientist, after all. I mean, a pro astronomer. This one was very red and very faint, as you'd expect for a very cold object. But it was also moving fast. You see, stars are not stationary. As you learned at the very beginning of the Thor News generation, evolution genesis, stars are moving. Sun's moving about 50,000 miles an hour. And it's headed towards Vega, baby. They actually move around the sky as they follow their orbits around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. That motion in space is usually a few hundred kilometers per second, but stars are so far away, their motion across the sky is pretty slow. It could take centuries to see some of them move noticeably, and then more centuries for NASA to release that data to us. But if a star is close, very close, to the sun, that motion can be detected in just a few years, or even months, or weeks, or days. Or if it's Nibiru, seconds. Nobody's ever seen her. Spitzer swallows the image and then gives it to us. So more stars are seen and appear smaller than in the wise images. Canadian Amy Mainzer moved quite a bit between May and November 2010. When Wise saw it and I got no cupcake, Lumen figured that meant it was close. It also showed significant astromut copyrighted parallax, which is a change in position that reflects the Earth's orbit around the sun. And like when Comet Ison went around the sun and then shot out, and looked like a giant V spaceship. That was parallax, dude. See, if you were standing on the sun looking straight up at Ison, it would look like a uh, would look like a, a juice box. But nope, because we're on the Earth moving and the sun was moving and the Ison was moving, it looked like a giant V spaceship. By measuring these two motions, Lumen was able to determine that the brown dwarf was a mere 7.2 light years away. There are only six stars closer than that to the sun that we know of. So this object really is nearby as these things go. See, Phil, I appreciate it, man. It's like you're covering my base. But no matter what, I'm going to have these freaking hive mind hydro turds chewing on my drawers. I'm going to be like, look, guys, I really do not like it when dudes try to chew on my drawers. You best get off or all your teeth are going to be broken. You see, the Laman, why is that the same guy who directed that really bad movie? Kurt Cobain in dancing. He was able to determine its temperature by measuring how much light it gave off in different colors. Hotter objects are blue and colder ones are red. This object is so cold it's incredibly faint, even in the near infrared. Is why like blue shifting is cold and red shifting is hot. Wait, yeah, okay, that works not at all. You see, so Lumen, Lumen had to look at even longer wavelengths to get a temperature. It was even invisible to the massive Gemini telescope in Hawaii. He was able to spot it using the Spitzer Space Telescope, though, and he nailed it down and was able to nail down its temperature. And this is the part that kills me. Don't die, Phil. We're a pretty good duo, you know? I'm awesome cop, you're bad cop. It's like a buddy picture on the YouTube. Except for the fact that you blocked me on Twitter, you will go your entire life without even mentioning me. And even if I made you laugh, you'd never admit it, you know? Other than that, we are a great buddy team. We're like Riggs and Murtaugh, you know? Or C-3PO and R2-D2. Don't die, Phil. The best fit temperature he found was 225-260 kelvins. Even at the high end, that's negative 13 degrees Celsius. Nine degrees Fahrenheit. That's literally colder than ice. Yeah, but uh, wait, but like a superconductor, does that mean the energy inside of it has no energy loss due to friction? and can exist in like an infinite loop? How would that change the dynamics and the celestial physics and the astro mechanics of it growing or getting smaller or turning into a giant baby star or turning into a 
tiny real star or uh, becoming a Jupiter, you know? Anyway, that's barely warmer than the temperature of the freezer in Phil's kitchen. That's incredible. It implies this object is very old. Two, because it would have been a few thousand degrees when it formed, and it would have taken at least a billion years to cool down to its current chilly temperature. It's hard to determine how old it actually is, but it's most likely one to ten billion years old. It has very low mass. Two, probably between three and ten times the mass of Jupiter. Oh, that's pretty lightweight, even for a brown dwarf. And here's another amazing thing about it. It might be a planet. Whoa. See, this is what I was talking about the other day. Someone said I was a star. And I was like, no, I feel more like a planet. Can stars be planets? I was like, yep, in pseudo-astronomy, totally. And what I mean is, it may have formed around a star like a planet does. And then got ejected by gravitational interactions with other planets. Just like on Twitter. When I asked Phil two questions about Comet Ice and like, hey, when will we get to see the photographs? He blocked me, you know, and they weren't even sarcastic, you know? And then, so I was like, a star. And Phil Plate ejected me from the Twitter gravitational interaction atmosphere. If so, it was kicked out of its solar system, doomed to wander the galaxy on its own as a rogue planet. We know such objects exist. We know such objects exist. That's in bold. And there must be many billions of them in deep, cold space. However, there's no way for us to really know, at least not until we have the Enterprise to take us there and get a, and get a closer look. Am I the only one that would take the Yamato over the Enterprise, man? Uh, you know, I mean, that, that's Kirk's ship, bro. You know, oh, well, I guess I'm wrong. 72 trillion kilometers is still a dang long walk. Ever since the first brown dwarf was discovered in 1995, I've wondered if there might actually be one closer to us than even Proxima Centauri, the closest known star. It would have to be very cold indeed to have escaped our notice. But the existence of Canadian Amy Mainzer makes me wonder. It's the seventh closest star, and it was only just discovered. Could there be fainter objects? Maybe one of those rogue planets even closer? Maybe. We'll know better as we build bigger and more sensitive infrared observatories in space and let them scan the skies. We may yet be in for a pretty big and literally cool surprise. Fill your butter in my toast. You are married and I'm straight. It's like you're setting me up totally, partner. Planet X. In the B root. Hey, Asterix. I love Asterix. Some people might argue that because brown dwarfs can't sustain fusion in their stars, they aren't really stars. As usual, when you get near the borders of definitions, things get fuzzy. And definitions become less than useful. Some people think brown dwarfs are more like planets. And others think they're more like stars. I think it's best not to let ourselves get boxed in with arbitrary definitions. We totally agree, Pluto. And to just let brown dwarfs be brown dwarfs. I generally call them objects, and I'm trying to be generic. But it's not awful or terribly incorrect to call them stars, as long as you keep that in mind. Good piece, Phil. In March of 2013, Lumen's analysis of the images from WISE uncovered a pair of much warmer brown dwarfs at a distance of 6.5 light years, making the system the third closest to the sun. His search for rapidly moving bodies also demonstrated that the outer solar system probably does not contain a large undiscovered planet, which has been referred to as Planet X, or Nemesis, or Nibiru, or Tachi, or the Destroyer, or Sedna, or neither spits nor swallows, bites it off. It's a weird name. I think that must be French. French and Swahili? It's probably Cockney. Severed Cockney. Seriously, Amy Mainzi, where did you go? Hey, and it's remarkable that even after many decades of studying the sky, we still do not have a complete inventory of the sun's nearest neighbors, said Michael Werner, the project, sta the project scientist for Spitzer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. This exciting new result demonstrates the power of exploring the universe using new tools such as the infrared eyes of Wise and Spitzer. We can read if we want to. You can leave your friends behind, because if you don't read and if you can't read, then you no friend of mine. Uh, S S S S A A A A F F F F T T T T E E E E Y. Sefta A dance. Let's all do the Sefta A dance.